We've been doing a series on grace and we titled this series as Abounding Grace. The title comes, as you know, from Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where Paul says, where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Meaning that when sin comes into a person's life, it abounds in the sense that it completely takes control, destroys and ruins and damages everything. But God unleashes his grace at the time of salvation. That's why the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. So when grace comes in, it, it counters that sin very well because grace abounds much more than sin. So it exerts a greater power so that all that sin damaged and destroyed is remedied and repaired. But not only that, the believer is brought and to a higher level and made more beautiful and wonderful than ever by the grace of God. So this is a teaching about salvation and the work of God's grace upon a believer's life throughout his life in making him and shaping him into the person that God wants him to be. So this is a very important teaching. When you teach about grace, some people misunderstand that such people who teach grace dislike law and that they dismiss law and depreciate law and they don't give importance to the law and even to the Old Testament in general. This idea is there among people. This is not a present day problem. This is a problem that has been there since the days of Jesus. Jesus was known as a big law violator by the Jews of the day. When Paul and Peter and others started preaching, they were accused as people that preached against the law of Moses. So it has been there from the first century onwards and it continues even today. That when you preach grace, immediately the other camps wants to emphasize the law and the importance of the law and they claim that by teaching grace, you're doing away with the law of God. So in order to clarify the role that the law of God plays in the life of a Christian believer, I went into a kind of teaching since last week. We looked at John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 17, where John makes this statement, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Why is John making this statement in the beginning of his Gospel? He's going to deal with some of these matters because he's writing to the early church, that is the first century church, and there are people there, Jews and Gentiles, who have heard the Christian message. And the Christian message in those days consisted a lot of things from the Old Testament. You know, how the Old Testament foretold Christ and how it's been fulfilled and so on. And the laws of God were taught also because in order to teach about sin and what it has done and so that Christ can be understood. You know, so a lot of things were taught from the Old Testament. So the Jews and Gentiles were familiar with the Old Testament in the first century church. And they all had this question about the law. That since now Christ has come, see the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Since Christ has come and the law was only to point to Christ, the job of the law, the purpose of the law was to only to prove that we are sinners and to show that we cannot save ourselves and to show that we needed a savior and to show the way of salvation, to teach all these things, the law was given, the Ten Commandments and the sacrifices and all of those things were given. It's done its job. It's pointed us to Christ. It has brought us all the way to Christ. And why is the law necessary anymore, they say. They say, should we now depreciate it, dismiss it, completely get rid of it? They think uh, there is no value to the law anymore. It has done its job and completed it. It is a no relevance to us today as Christian believers. Some people think like that. So the early church Christians had this question. Does it have any relevance to us or does it not have any relevance to us? If it does have any relevance to us, in what way does it have any relevance to us? These are the questions that were in their minds and John was trying to clear up their doubts. And that is why John and Paul and others write about these things because this was a big question that was in the minds of the believers of that day. So he addresses this question. The question of the relationship of the believer, New Testament believer, to the law of God. 
does the new testament believer have any kind of relationship to the law anymore we showed last week yes there is a kind of relationship between the new testament believer and the law the law still serves certain purposes in the believer's life i showed you last week how that if you don't understand the law and the teachings of the law concerning sin and concerning the condemnation that sin brings on concerning the punishment and the penalty that the law extracts the law teaches about sin the horror of sin and the law teaches about the condemnation that comes upon the sinner the law teaches about the penalty that is exacted by the law and the law teaches about how to remedy that sin and all of that until and unless you have that knowledge how can you appreciate what jesus has done because jesus is the answer to what the lord demanded that is why john says this the law came through moses but grace and truth came through jesus christ it's another way of saying the law came demanding certain things condemning and putting man under punishment and exacting penalties of man the law demands and the answer to the demands of the law is met by jesus that's why he says it like that the law came through moses and grace and truth came through jesus christ the law brought a problem the law makes certain demands and jesus meets those demands for us and that is what the basic statement means actually so today we go a little further into that and see still the relationship that the believer has with the law that's the focus again today let us look at what our relationship is to the law of god as christians i can put it under three headings all right three things that the bible says about this one is this the statement is made in romans chapter 10 and verse 4 it says christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believes Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Now, after saying that, he goes on in the rest of the chapter trying to explain that. But he's been teaching that throughout the book of Romans, basically, you know, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all those that believe. For example, if you go to Romans chapter 3, verse 20 to 24, you read that there therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin in other words he's saying the law can only show you that there is sin show you your sin your sinfulness it cannot do anything more than that it cannot justify you by the deeds of the law by working the law no flesh can be justified it can only show you that you are a sinner because there is sin in you you cannot ever do what the law says therefore you cannot be justified by the law but now the righteousness of god apart from the law is revealed the thing about the gospel this is what paul is very thrilled about he says the thing about the gospel is that the righteousness of god apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets the old testament entire old testament prophesies foretells this righteousness of god which is apart from the law <laughs> this pharisee paul was a pharisee at one time a jewish pharisee has now been converted and now he believes that the entire old testament is not talking about justification by the law he was at one time having that kind of understanding that it will justify him but now he has come to believe that no it doesn't justify anybody the righteousness of god apart from the law is now revealed in the gospel the greatest thing about the gospel is that it reveals the righteousness which is apart from the law even the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference gentile or jew doesn't make any difference for everyone who believes the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ is available he says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god everyone has sinned jew gentile everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of god he says 
we are now being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus so christ when he came see john says for the law came through moses but grace came through jesus grace and truth came through jesus christ when jesus christ came grace came and that became the end of the law for righteousness all right he's been teaching that for a long time back uh, in the book of romans even in chapter 1 he says i'm not ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ for it is the power of god unto salvation for everyone who believes for the jew first and also for the greek and listen to this for in it there is in the gospel that's why he's proud of it for in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith in the gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of god which is available by faith in jesus christ all right so he really is very proud of that this is what he understood and this is what he came to believe on the road to damascus and this is what he discovered and is mighty proud of this thing and the whole epistle of romans is an exposition of how this righteousness which is from god is given to us through faith in jesus christ so this is a very basic statement we need to get a hold of it as christians in our understanding of our relationship to the law that christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believes and christ came that marks the end of the law for righteousness that means we don't seek to be justified by the works of the law we seek this righteousness that come by faith in christ all right see the problem for all of us is about how to get righteousness see we can't stand in the presence of god unless we get this righteousness because god is righteous and holy He doesn't want any righteousness. He wants us to be as righteous as He is. You know, be ye holy even as I am holy, you know. Otherwise, don't come near. That's the policy of God, you know. You cannot go taking your righteousness, your goodness. It counts as filthy rags before God, you see. You got to go with His holiness, His righteousness. This is the problem. This is why Job in the old days said, How can a man be righteous before God? Tell me, how can a man go stand before God, before, before God is righteous, he said. And Martin Luther had the same problem. He said, how come this cruel God at one time as a priest, he thought God was so cruel that he demanded a righteousness that he could never produce, no matter how much he tried. He became vexed with this idea that he could never come up with that righteousness that God requires. He requires righteousness on his level. How can I give it? I'm a human being, he says. At that time, and he came to the end of his efforts is trying after all that sweating he looks to god and eyes get opened and he says oh because i cannot produce it god has given it the righteousness from god through faith in jesus christ he discovers the gospel and that is how the protestant movement came about all right so the law of god tells us about the type of righteousness that god demands what type of righteousness does god demand look at the 10 commandments that's the type of righteousness that god demands you know what type of righteousness the type of righteousness is very high it is not about whether you have done something that god's law commands you to do and you have refrained from doing things that god's law forbids you to do it's not about what you did or what you didn't do in other words it's about what you have in your heart is there sin in your heart if you look at a woman with lustful eye you've already committed adultery with her he says people say who then can be worthy before god that's exactly the point that's the type of righteousness that god requires a righteousness that we could never come up with if it was only on based on what we did or did not do we can say all right i never did that you know therefore i'm not guilty of that but he says but you got it in your heart you never did that but you got it in your heart therefore sin is in your heart now where can i go and fix this problem you know everybody's got that 
because sin is in our hearts. So the law requires, the law shows, if you read the Ten Commandments, the first nine commandments tell us what to do and what not to do. It's about doing and not doing. The Tenth Commandment is about what is in your heart. Thou shalt not covet. And Paul says in Romans chapter 7, the Tenth Commandment is the key to the interpretation of all commandments. And look at Jesus' interpretation in the Sermon on the Mount. He interprets everything. The adultery case, the murder, everything. He interprets not by action of murder, action of adultery, but by what is in the heart. <laughs> so the law tells us what kind of righteousness God requires. This is the high class righteousness that God requires. How can we give that righteousness? The answer is Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What does he mean? Why did Jesus come into the world? He came into the world to become the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He came into the world to take over from us this burden, this problem of the law that condemns us, that makes us all sinners before God. He came because it was a burden that we could not bear. He became because no one and nothing provided answer for this. He came because the Lord declares all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He came to take this whole question of obtaining a righteousness that will satisfy God. He's taken over the problem of the law from us to himself. That is what is meant by saying he is the end of the law for righteousness. How did he do it? How did he become the end of the law for righteousness? He did it in two ways. How did he become the end of the law for righteousness? In two ways. One, he perfectly obeyed the law of God. No one has ever perfectly been able to obey the law of God. Perfect obedience. Not just based on actions, but heart obedience. Perfect obedience in actions and heart. He was pure. Perfect obedience was given by him. He became our representative. He became the new man, the second Adam after that first Adam messed it all up. He has now become the last Adam, the last man. He has given perfect obedience to God's law. That Adam plunged us all into sin by one man sinning. We all became sinners. By this one man's obedience and perfect obedience, we all get righteousness. That's the story of the gospel. One man, as a representative of the entire human race, sinned and plunged all of us into sin. And one man, Jesus Christ, through his obedience, Romans chapter 5 says it exactly like that, through his obedience, brought salvation to all of us. He plunged us into sin, but this Jesus, by his obedience, brought us into righteousness. So, Perfect obedience. Secondly, something else was also needed. The law not only demanded obedience, perfect obedience. The law was broken, you see. And because the law was broken, there was a penalty attached to the breaking of the law. Therefore, the law demands that penalty must be paid. So the law is thundering out its penalty upon our transgressions and our failures. And the penalty must be exacted. These are the fundamental truths about the gospel, you see. The law must be fulfilled in every detail. The law's requirements must be carried out in every detail. And this is the message of the grace of God, you see. And that is why John is saying, the law was given by Moses. Once again, listen to this. The law was given by Moses. It's like saying, the law came with its demands, condemning, announcing its penalty upon your transgressions. The law came by Moses, condemning man, declaring everyone as sinners, declaring everyone under punishment and the wrath of God. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, do you understand what I'm talking about? See, that's not an ordinary statement. It's a very powerful statement. So in this way, Christ became the end of the law for righteousness for everyone. Not only by perfectly obeying the law of God, but also by taking our penalty. 
the law exacted the penalty would not let go somebody must pay the penalty as our representative he went on the cross he took our punishment he died for our for us in our place so that we can have his righteousness so christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes not for everyone but everyone who believes have you believed do you believe see this is why christians rejoice that's why we sing that's why we shout for joy because god has given us his righteousness that's why apostle paul is proud of the gospel he says i'm not ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ because he has finally discovered where righteousness come from he was one of those pharisees who was looking for righteousness to come as a result of his perfect obedience to the law and it was never coming he was sweating and trying very hard and finally on the road to damascus he got his eyes opened and he saw that it comes through faith in jesus christ now look at what he says in chapter 3 of philippians and verse 7 to 9 he says but what things were gained to me that i have counted loss for christ why He says, I can't count everything that I considered gain as nothing, as loss because of Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Just knowing this Christ is so valuable to me that I count everything else as nothing compared to this, he says. Indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. and count them as rubbish because he believed in Christ and put his faith in Christ he's lost a lot now but he says i count that as rubbish the jewish people don't respect him they've rejected him he says i consider it as rubbish so that i may gain christ christ is more important than all that he says why see listen to this and be found in him that i may gain christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness listen to this which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith he's just thrilled about it and the whole epistle to the romans is about it galatians is about it and many other portions of the scriptures are about it now so christ is the end of the law for those that believe now what does this mean in practice let me put before you one or two things one you must always think of your salvation in terms of the law and our relationship to the law you see you should not think about us, uh, your salvation as a matter of feeling you know it's not like i feel saved and i don't feel saved not like that you must always think of salvation in terms of the law that is the law demands perfect obedience the law demands punishment and Christ came and legally satisfied the law law came through moses the grace and truth came through jesus this is the solution to my problem there is a legal solution to my problem it's not what i feel i remember a friend of mine got married abroad i was there and uh, i was part of that ceremony i was giving him the vows and and i leaned over to him and i said do you feel married as soon as i gave the vows to him and declared them man and wife i said do you feel married he looked at me and said no i feel just like i felt yesterday but he can't just go home leaving his wife behind you know because he is now legally bound to that woman he's legally married now to cancel that you got to go to court you got to fight a case <laughs> to do away with this it's a legal matter it binds you to that person that you married and uh, that's exactly what has happened in our case you see there is a legal thing that has happened the law demanded jesus christ met the demands the just demands of the law law came through moses grace and truth came through jesus christ the law demanded grace gave all that the law demanded satisfied all that the law demanded so you must always think of it in those terms legal terms not in feelings all right Secondly you must never think of salvation in terms of having to keep the law in any form. You know, it may looks like a contradiction but it's not contradiction. First I said you must think of your salvation only in terms of the law. What law demands and what grace gives. 
That is one thing. Secondly, you must never think of salvation in terms of having to keep the law. It's because you never got saved by keeping the law. So why do you, after getting saved, think of your salvation in terms of keeping the law? You didn't get saved by keeping the law. You, the, keeping the law didn't make you righteous. Keeping the law didn't bring you salvation. He kept the law. And you put your faith in him. That's how you got saved. Why do you think that you are not saved at the very moment you did your first sin? Why do you doubt your salvation? Never think of your salvation in terms of having to keep the law. Because... You never got saved by keeping the law. Don't go back into that again. You know, that is not right. That means you don't understand the relationship that you have with the law. The relationship you have with the law is not like that. See, the relationship that you have with the, with the law is not that kind of relationship anymore. You are out of that. Your relationship to God is not based on whether you fulfilled all the laws of God or not. The relationship with God that you have is based on whether you put your faith in Jesus Christ or not. That's what it is. All right. Thirdly, in practical ways when you look at it, you should not now rely on anything that you do or anything that you are. You see, you must keep it the way it is. It is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is what He has done and your faith in Him. Don't bring yourself into it. Don't bring what you are and what you do into it. The moment you bring yourself into it and what you are and what you do, anything that you do or anything that you are, you have left the position of grace and gone back into the law. Galatians 2.21 tells a wonderful thing. It says, if Righteousness can come by the law, it says, then Christ died in vain. It's a waste that Christ died. If by your observance of the law, you can receive righteousness, then Christ died in vain. So don't bring yourself into it at all. All right. Secondly, first is Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, right? Secondly, Christ has delivered us from being under the law. And this is found in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. For you are not under law, but under grace. Very clear. But what does it mean? What does it mean when you say you are not under law, but under grace? A lot of people misunderstand this. You are not under law means they can dismiss the law, they can depreciate the law, they can throw away the law, that the law has no relevance to them, they think. See, this is, this is where we miss it. We have, we have to understand it very minutely. It's a wonderful truth. When Paul says that we are not under the law but under grace, what does he mean? He means that Christ has delivered us from the condemnation of the law. We were under the law in that way. In the, under the law in what way? We were under the law in this way that the law demanded certain kind of righteousness from us, demanded perfect obedience to his moral laws, and we could not give it. Therefore, we were condemned. We were under penalty, punishment. Lost the soul that sins must die. You see, we were under condemnation. We were under the wrath of God. We were under the law. The law condemned us. We stood as condemned people under the law. And Paul is simply saying, you're not under the law now. That means that condemnation is not there. You're delivered. Our Christ has delivered us from that condemnation of the law. So we are not under the law in that sense. In the sense of the condemnation, we are not under the law. Our whole position and relationship to God is no longer determined by the law. It's not determined by whether we did what the law says or not. But by Christ who has completely and perfectly fulfilled the law and paid the penalty and done everything for us. It is based on that. 
I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Must be very clear on this. If we are to truly rejoice in our salvation as we ought to. A lot of people can't rejoice because they don't hear these truths and they don't understand. They don't understand what happened in salvation. Your relationship with God, let me say to you, my friend, your relationship with God does not depend on your obedience to the law anymore. Your relationship with God now depends on your faith in Jesus Christ who fulfilled all the moral obligations of the law and took the penalty for breaking the law, you breaking the law, and done everything for you. Your relationship is based on that. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 7. Listen to this. Do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. See, when you live in a country or in some realm, there are some laws where you live. You're under that law. As long as you live there, you're under the law. When you die, you're no more under that law, right? In effect, Paul says, that you were living under the law. Now you are dead as far as the law is concerned. You died to the law. That means you are not under the law anymore. Just like a person who lived in a particular place was under the law of that place, now died and therefore is not under the law anymore. All right? And listen to this, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Now it goes into marriage example. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she's free from the law so that she is no adulteress though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. In other words, he says, compares marriage with this. He says, you were in a relationship with another husband before, that is the law, and you produced fruit, the fruit of condemnation, right? That's what resulted from that in that relationship to the law. Marriage to the law resulted in their condemnation. You stood condemned. But now, you're dead to that and you're married now to the one who's risen from the dead, Jesus Christ. And this relationship must produce fruit to God. It must bring forth good fruit. Beginning with justification, it will bring forth fruit of sanctification and all these other things. All right. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, once again, it's telling us that we are not under the law. No condemnation to those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of Life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, that's the law of sin and death. See, the law to which I was married to, the law to which I was tied to, the law under which I lived was the law of sin and death. There the law simply declared me a sinner and declared the penalty of death on me. That's the law of sin and death. Declared me as a sinner and declared the death punishment on me. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What a powerful statement. What does this all mean? Let me summarize it this way. It simply says that we are no longer under the law because we are dead to the law. The old relationship that existed between us and the law is no longer valid. We are not under the law. We are not under condemnation. No, no, no. We are, we are under Christ now. We are under grace. The reason for that is because the Lord Jesus Christ, as I have indicated earlier, has given complete obedience to the demands of the moral laws of God and has paid the penalty for breaking the law, for me breaking the law. 
That's the reason. That's the reason I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace because he has done it all. He's given perfect obedience and he has paid my penalty fully, completely. So as far as we are concerned, the law has nothing to do with us. It cannot condemn us, that means. Nothing to do with us means it cannot condemn us. It cannot punish us and announce its penalty upon us. We are dead to the law in the sense that our status and our relationship today to God does not depend on our fulfilling the law because the demands of the law have already been fulfilled for us in Christ Jesus. And that gives us a standing with God. He became our representative. He took our place like Adam sinned and we all were plunged into sin, became sinners and condemned. Now through Jesus' perfect obedience, now all those who believe can enter into a relationship with God based on the righteousness, the standing that he has given. I lost my standing because Adam, my forefather, the first man, sinned. I gained my standing because my representative, Jesus, he took my punishment and he gave perfect obedience. That gives me standing before God. That's the basis of my standing. So we can say I'm dead to the law. What a wonderful truth it is. What does this mean in practical terms? Let me mention a few things. If this is true, if what I just said is true, then we must never listen to the accusations of the devil because he always comes to tempt us and he does tempt us all. If you have not felt his temptation in that way, him trying to come and tell you that you are not a child of God, that you are not worthy, look at you, you sinner, you old sinner. And if he didn't lay condemnation on your mind, I'll be surprised, my friend. Every child of God has felt it at one time or the other, and even great saints of God have felt it. The condemnation sense of condemnation comes on us because the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Never listen to the accusation. Every Christian is tempted this way. But one thing about a Christian, a true Christian is, a Christian has the answer to this. He has the answer to it. Immediately the Christian should wake up and say, no, listen, my relationship with God does not depend on my perfect obedience. Yeah, I may have faltered, I may have sinned, but my relationship with God does not depend upon my perfect obedience. My relationship with God depends upon His perfect obedience, Him carrying the penalty for me. Therefore, I have the right to stand in God's presence. All right. Secondly, we must never allow ourselves to, be, to feel condemned, you see. Christians must never feel dejected in any sense. You know, the Bible tells us to examine ourselves and some people, you know, take that and go into really condemning themselves and go into a condemnation trip within them, their minds, you know. Yeah, surely when you think about your holiness and your perfection, certainly you feel miserable because we are not so perfect. Yeah. So when you think about the way you have done things and the way your heart is thinking, your, the way your mind is going and how you have thought things that you should not think and maybe you have done things that you should not do and you have not been so perfect. When you think of that, you feel miserable. But the thing is, a Christian should never stay miserable. You must never stay in that condition. That's the difference between a true Christian and a one who's not a Christian, who thinks he is a true Christian believer and a one who thinks he's a Christian believer. A man who thinks that he's a Christian believer relies upon his works and the devil can very easily make him 
feel utterly dejected. But he can never make a Christian feel utterly dejected. Because the Christian will always say, yeah, I admit that I'm not perfect. I admit that I'm a failure. But my righteousness is in him and not in myself. You must never lie down in condemnation. Thirdly, we must never doubt our salvation simply because we fall into the temptation. Never doubt our salvation simply because we fall into the temptation. A lot of people say as soon as they fall into a temptation, well, if I was a true Christian, I would not have fallen into it. And then they are guilty and they are under condemnation again. See, that's because they don't understand the relationship to the law, the Christian's relationship to the law. What is your relationship to the law? You are not under the law. That's your relationship to the law. The law cannot condemn you anymore. Your relationship to God does not depend upon your perfect obedience to the law. That is your relationship to the law. The law will speak to you and condemn you, but you can speak up and say, Christ has answered you. The law came through Moses, but Christ has brought grace. And you are under the grace of God, not under the law of God. Fourthly, it's the duty of every Christian believer to have assurance of his position, to have the joy of salvation and to rejoice in Christ. You see, you must never sacrifice that for anything. Some people say, well, you don't know the state of my heart. I'm really evil and bad on the inside. I know my heart. That's why I'm feeling bad, you know. Well, if you're holding on still to the state of your heart and uh, you think that's what determines your relationship with Jesus, you have not understood the message about your relationship to the law. See, now you're putting yourself under the law again. You're allowing the law to condemn you, you see. No, yeah, in your heart you may have wrong things and you may find yourself miserable in that way. But you must always wake up and say, my relationship to God depends upon what Jesus has done for me and not on my perfect obedience. And I am not under the law. The law has no right to condemn me because I am under grace. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law demanded these things on my behalf that I must be punished and I must uh, carry my penalty. But grace came and delivered me from all that. The grace that came through Jesus Christ. That's your answer. All right. Finally, thirdly. So first, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Secondly, Christ has brought us from under the law to under grace. Right? We're not under the law because of Christ. We're now under grace. Thirdly, Christ through the Spirit enables us to fulfill the law. Now this is very important. Grace is enablement, you see. He enables us to fulfill the law. See, what is our relationship to the law? See, some people think we can dismiss the law. We don't need the law. You know, we don't have to do what the law says. No, no, no. Our relationship to God does not depend on our perfect obedience to the law. Remember, my friend, that's one thing. Our relationship to God does not depend upon our perfect, perfect obedience to the law. But do we fulfill the law? Yes, we fulfill the law. Doesn't mean that we throw away the law and we don't, we don't fulfill the law. We don't say we are not under the law, therefore the law has nothing to do with us. Christ, through the Spirit, enables us to fulfill the law. It's a very important truth. It's a very important test of Christian life. The life of those that are under grace. You must never think of God's grace as something that promotes lawlessness. See, that is what people accuse people who teach grace of. They think that we are teaching lawlessness, that you can do anything and get away with it. No, we are not doing that. We are simply saying our relationship with God does not depend upon our perfect obedience. That's all we are saying. It depends upon Christ's perfect obedience and what he has done. 
we are not saying that you can do anything and get away with it you can never think of grace of god as just the way of escape or just the way of forgiveness or just something that sets us free you know you can never think of grace as you know well sin all you like it's all right you're not under the law but under grace that's not what grace teaching is all about that's the most terrible thing to say that is a violation a travesty of this doctrine that is what is lawlessness all about see if grace does not enable me to keep and to live the law of god then it means that the devil has triumphed over god listen to this if grace does not enable me to keep the law then it means that the devil has triumphed over god it's a very serious statement how do i come to that conclusion so what did the devil do at the fall he did not just make man disobey god he did something more than that he took man and made him his slave and made him incapable of obeying god and honoring god's law and salvation means that the works of the devil are to be entirely undone and nullified therefore it includes this that man must be given the ability to live and keep the law of god otherwise the devil has succeeded if salvation just means that we are forgiven though we fail and we still go on failing then i will say that the devil has triumphed but the devil has not triumphed in reality the grace of god by the grace of god the devil has been utterly defeated the lord jesus christ did not come into the world simply to give us forgiveness though he does give us forgiveness this is only my first need and that's not all that i need i need something more Why did God's son leave heaven and come into the world? Let me read you some verses quickly. Matthew 1:21. Remember an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream when he was trying to put away Mary and tells him about Jesus that he shall save his people from their sin. Remember what it says, not just save them from the guilt of their sins. but from their sins saving from the sin is different from saving from the guilt of sin let's never forget that saving from sin itself not just the guilt of sin that's forgiveness the guilt is gone but saving from sin itself matthew uh, gospel chapter 5 verse 17 Jesus said I have not come to destroy the law but to fulfill the law you know he says I have not come to destroy the law but to fulfill the law the law demands perfect obedience I have come to perfectly obey not only that I have come to bring salvation and through that there will be enablement given to men and women who believe and they will fulfill the law you see and listen to Paul in Romans chapter 3 Verse thirty-one: Shall we then make the law void? He says, "Nay, God forbid." And then he says, "We establish the law." That means we never should interpret grace as that which gets rid of the law. See, in chapter three, when he is discussing the whole thing, he knows that the Jews will object, saying, "Well, what you say is that the law never justifies anyone." So why did God give us the law? You know, the law is of no use. Should we then just make the law void since it is of no use to us that the law cannot justify us as you say? Should we just throw out the law because it is of no value? That's what the Jews would have said and he he imagines them asking that question and he raises that question and says, "No, that's not what I'm saying. We cannot make the law void." See, a lot of people think that that's what New Testament preaching is. to make the law void no we do not make the law void he says god forbid we establish it he says how do we establish it because the ultimate aim 
of salvation is to for grace to enable us to fulfill the law turn the table around romans chapter 6 verse 14 says sin shall not have dominion over you why because grace enables the fulfillment of the law because you are not under the law but under grace see grace comes in and enables you to fulfill what the law says romans chapter 8 verse 3 and 4 says for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh god did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law listen to this might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit what the law could not do jesus has done he says So the ultimate aim is that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us so that we may start fulfilling the law. Romans chapter 13 and verse 8 to 10 answers that big question of whether the Ten Commandments have any relevance for us now. The moral laws of God and the demands of God's moral law has any relevance for us now. Look at verse 8 to 10. Oh no one anything except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Which law is talking about? Talking about the moral laws of God. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery. See, if you have any doubt, that's what he's referring to, the 10 commandments. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment are all summed up in this saying namely you shall love your neighbor as yourself love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law people say do we still follow the 10 commandment do we still obey the 10 commandment is the 10 commandment relevant to us do we still have to go by the 10 commandment look at what he says love is the fulfillment of the law all of these commandments are contained in that one commandment love he says titus 2:11 says for the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works <laughs> there are people out there that say well you are there teaching grace they they are saying that you don't need works who said so those who accuse have not heard anything of grace preaching true grace preaching does not say that we don't need any good works yeah we believe in these good works zealous for good works christ redeemed us why did he redeem us he redeemed us from every lawless deed so that he may purify us to make us his own special people zealous for good works this is christianity christianity is not saying do as you like sin as much as you like it's exactly the opposite of that it says you are forgiven therefore you live by the power of the spirit keeping the law of god that god intended for man to keep from the beginning the 10 commandments are a picture of what god had in mind when he created man the way that man should live and grace alone gives us the power to fulfill the law we just read romans chapter 7 And verse 4 says that you're married now to Christ and that marriage produces fruit the fruit of good works and what is the fruit of good works keeping the law doing what God intended for man to do from the beginning and look at Romans chapter 7 verse 6 but now we've been delivered from the law having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit not in the oldness of the letter what is it saying It is saying we still keep the law but we keep it in a new way. Before we are trying it out 
in the letter but now we are doing it in the spirit there is a difference in the way that we fulfill the law 1 john chapter 5 verse 3 says we keep the commandments of god and the commandments of god are not grievous it's not a burdensome thing one translation says the commandments of god are not burdensome this was taught to christian believers that they could keep it and it is not going to be a burdensome thing see this is the relationship of the believer to the law it's like this you know imagine a kid trying to learn the piano and is basically doesn't have an inclination towards it and he's struggling he's struggling with every bit of every piece every line and he's trying very hard and he's just trying to go by the notes and just trying to look at what he's playing and look at his hands and look at the sheet and so on <laughs> that's how he struggles and tries to play but you look at his teacher and he's a concert pianist and he puts his hand on the piano he doesn't even have to look at it he doesn't have to struggle it just comes with ease he just plays with such ease smoothly he just concentrates on expression he doesn't have to concentrate on every note and all but he concentrates on the expressions and plays it beautifully doesn't even think about it much and plays it it's something like that christ the spirit sent his spirit into us the spirit that was in him is in us we are now put in a position where by his power the power of grace we are enabled to live and obey the law of god and be what god has always intended for us to be so never go to extremes to lawlessness on the one side or legalism on the other side but go this way what is the way that john is saying the law was given by moses it was demanding accusing condemning punishing announcing its penalty grace but grace but grace and truth came through jesus christ it is forgiving empowering enabling giving us power the law demanded grace meets all its demands think of it like that that is the christian's relationship to the law let's pray father god in the name of jesus we come we thank you lord for this wonderful truth i pray that it will get into the hearts of people that they'll begin to digest it understand it we thank you for your grace your grace has come to meet all the demands the just demands of the laws of god we were sinners we were guilty we were condemned we were lost but grace has come the law came through moses condemning us announcing our penalty and punishment and our death grace has come announcing our life and our empowerment and our strength and our newness of life we thank you father for grace has come help us to understand grace and live and walk in that grace walk in a victorious christian life we pray for every believer that is listening today and every child of god that is listening today may they begin to understand what kind of empowerment has happened as a result of salvation that grace has come through jesus christ grace has come we are not under the law grace has come christ has become the end of the law grace has come to enable us to do what the law demands and says thank you father we pray for victorious christian living we pray for joy in the holy ghost as they live for god thank you father thank you jesus we give you all the glory and we pray for people that are in need today in problems today in difficulties today people that are looking to you today your grace is more than enough 
your grace is available to everyone to all those who call upon you lord i pray today that you will minister to people that call upon you today that look to you today minister your strength you are minister your health minister your peace minister your joy to them oh god meet their every need we speak blessings over people in jesus name we pray amen now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of the father the fellowship of the holy spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore amen